بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا All praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessings be upon his final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran what translates to O you who believe fear Allah as he should be feared and die not except in a state of Islam uh, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I will welcome you into our new uh, series of lectures. Uh, the title is uh, the story of Al-Andalus or the history of Al-Andalus. And subhanAllah, yani I'm uh, so excited and uh, delighted to present this series to you, inshaAllah. And uh, subhanAllah, it's, uh, yani the story of Al-Andalus is the, uh, the story that repeats itself every day of our life. SubhanAllah, when you look at the story of Andalus, it's as if the history repeats itself. And it, as if the Muslims are looking at a mirror to what's happening nowadays, SubhanAllah. And uh, SubhanAllah, this story is so amazing that it is full of uh, victories and defeats, full of conspiracies and rises, full of highs and lows, Full of good things and unfortunately full of very sad things. Uh, SubhanAllah, the start of the story of Andalus is so happy. And when we go through the story of Andalus, there's some very happy moments. But unfortunately, it comes to a very sad end. But the story of Andalus is definitely worth visiting, inshallah, for the, for the great benefits that we can reap from this uh, story. So the story of Andalus, I look at it and it's as if like the lost treasure. It's like full of treasures, wallahi, yani. It's, it's even better than the, the, all the pearls and the gold and the diamonds you can ever imagine. And all the lessons and all the ibar and all the things that we can learn from, subhanAllah, is so good. And I cannot wait until I share this with you, inshallah. And, and uh, let's, inshallah, go to the story of Andalus. So during the story of Andalus, inshallah, we will... Um, travel all around the Iberian Peninsula. We'll take you from the, the you know, Jabal Tariq all the way to Toledo, all the way to Madrid, uh, Valencia, Ajbilia, and all this, we'll live in all these towns, and we'll inshallah tell the story of the Muslims. And inshallah today, it's going to be mainly an introduction, a very important introduction, because we're not going to start from the Okay, Tariq ibn Ziyad went to the Andalus. We have to track the story from the beginning. And it's very important beginning. And subhanAllah, we have to understand that the victory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to those who plan. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anfal, in the chapter of Al-Anfal in the Quran, that always Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give victory to those who plan. So you have to plan. Do your best and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bring the victory. Like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during his journey from Mecca to Medina. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam planned it really well. Planned that the fact that he went to visit Abu Bakr to tell him about the time of the Hijrah in a time that no one usually goes out. It's in the midday when the sun, when the sun is, is high up. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, has prepared two camels specifically for this journey. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the beginning of his journey, he started by going south, which is completely the opposite way of Medina, but in order to deceive the people of Quraysh. And then what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought victory to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When the people of Quraysh were at the, the mouth of the cave where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr was hiding, they were very easy for the, for the kafirin, for the mushrikeen, um, to spot the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr. It was very easy. Abu Bakr said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Prophet of Allah, if they look behind their feet, they would see us. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is confident with the victory of Allah. Why? Because he knew he's done all his best. So he said to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, what about two? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the third. So, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah bring victory to us. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then got the best guide afterwards, after they survived the cave, got the best guide. He was a non-Muslim guide to travel with them from Mecca to Medina. And then, alhamdulillah, uh, they got all the way to Medina. But just as they go going to Medina, one of the kuffar at that time, his name is Suraqa, he tried to kill the Prophet And every time he tries to throw an arrow at the Prophet his horse would, would, subhanallah, would go up in the air and he will fall from the horse. Why? Because the Prophet did all his best. He did all the planning, the planning and he made dua. Dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring him victory. And this is exactly the same story with Andalus. Subhanallah, there's so much planning went into this, the, the conquest of Al-Andalus. It didn't come just in one day. Years and several years of planning, subhanAllah. It started about 70 years before. 70 years before. So inshallah, we'll go through the uh, introduction. Very important introduction today, inshallah. And in two weeks, inshallah, the, the, the lecture, inshallah, will be an absolute thriller. Inshallah, we'll talk about the actual conquest of Al-Andalus in the beginning phase. But today, Inshallah, we'll talk about a very important introduction to lay the foundation of this series, Inshallah, which is quite important. So, this is a very important question. Why do we study the history of Al-Andalus? And we just said, we touched on that, but it's very important to go through it, Inshallah. First of all, History repeats itself. Okay? Look at the Muslim world these days. The Muslim Ummah in a state of weakness. Why? Because the Muslims have deviated away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, the Muslims, subhanAllah, they drifted away from the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa They drifted away from the reasons of victory. And hence, the Ummah is in a state of weakness. So history repeats itself. When the Muslims went into an Andalus, it was a very powerful Islamic state. Very powerful. And during the, 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 the time that the Muslims spent in Andalus, this was time, there was time of, uh, of, of strength, and then followed by time of weakness. Time of strength and time of weaknesses. And subhanAllah, it's exactly the same thing. So it's as if the history of Al-Andalus and studying the history of Al-Andalus is a lesson for all the Muslims these days. It's like the mirror that we see the state of our own. So it's important to go to the, to the lessons of the past, to apply it to the present, and inshallah to get us to a better future. That's the importance of studying the, um, the, the important um, history of Al-Andalus. Now, the second thing is that the established way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, established ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never change. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Fatr, فَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبْدِيلًا وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَحْوِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fatr, which is, um, يعني, subhanahu wa ta'ala, يعني, uh, I believe it's the number 35, Surah number 35 of the Quran, chapter 35, Surah uh, chapter of Fatr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 43, the translation of the ayah we just said is that the established ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never change. The established ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is are solid and will never change. It's the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala victorious, He will make you victorious. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no getting around the sunnah. So the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when the Muslims go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go back to the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, understand the religion, happy to sacrifice for the religion, do everything in their possibilities to make their religion the priority, make Islam a priority. Now, if you ask 
a significant amount of the Muslims these days. How many of you actually pray Salat al-Fajr? How many pray Fajr on time? And by praying Fajr, we, means, we mean praying Fajr in the time of Fajr, from the dawn until the sunrise, not when the sun is up. This is not Salat al-Fajr. This is not Salat al-Subh. This, this, this is not the Salat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed on the Muslims. The Salat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Salat al-Fajr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed, or Salat al-Subh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed on the Muslims is between dawn and sunrise. After that, you know, the Salat is like a time stamp. After that, you've missed the time. Inna salat kanat ala al-mu'minin kitab al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the Salat for us, prescribed in specific times. You cannot pray the Maghrib during the Asr time. You cannot pray the Dhuhr during the Asr time. Obviously, there are some exceptions when you are traveling, then you do Salat al-Qasr and everything. But we're talking about, you know, when you're living in your city, and uh, subhanAllah, you have no reason not to pray the Salat on time. Because work is not a reason for you to miss the salah. Sorry, brother, I have work. I cannot leave uh, my work. Well, this, you, go, you, you are going to say this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you. You cannot say, I didn't want to go to the mosque because if I go to the mosque, someone will steal my shoes. <laughs> you cannot say that. This is very common in Egypt, subhanAllah. <laughs> Stealing shoes from the mosque. So you cannot say that. You cannot say, look, uh, brother, yani, uh, I have uh, problems and I'm sick, I cannot pray. SubhanAllah, even if you are sick, the Prophet وسلم, said you can pray when you're sitting. You can play, pray even when you're lying. You can even pray by your eyes if you cannot move your whole body. But the important thing is not to miss the prayer. So Muslims these days, they need to understand that it is very important for them to have Islam back as a priority in their life. To have Islam as a priority in your life. To have the calling for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a priority in your life. Yani, as Muslims, we have an obligation to convey the message. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says in the hadith, tell and convey the message that I give you even if, if it was one verse. Now, alhamdulillah, we know more than one verse. Alhamdulillah, we've read more than one hadith. Alhamdulillah, we know more than one rulings of the Islam. We know many, alhamdulillah. So convey the message. Convey the message. As the Prophet sallallahu was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to convey the message. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought up the companions to convey the message. And as the companions conveyed the message in the whole world. SubhanAllah, yani, uh, if you look at what the companions did for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the huge and vast lands that they conquered for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not even by fighting, by even by trading. And this is extremely important for us as Muslims living in the West. That we have to be a real image of our Islam, of our deen. To convey the message to those people. And to get even more important to convey the message to our Muslim brothers. And if you see someone at your work who does not pray, and you leave him without talking to him about praying, it's as if you are with the shaitan against him. Where is Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Imran Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas That you are the best nation brought out to people. Why? Why? Ta'muruna bil ma'arufi wa tanhawna anil munkari wa tu'minuna billah Why? Why we are the best nation? The reason is we enjoy what's good and forbid what's prohibited. You tell someone, look brother, you do not pray. Prayer is extremely important. Prayer is a sign of Iman. Prayer is a pillar of Islam. If you don't pray, 
you are on great danger. Dear brother, I encourage you, inshallah, that we may be in some stuff with each other, with each other praying together, inshallah. Encourage you. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us. Don't leave your brother and don't be with the shaitan against him. And similarly for the sisters, give the da'wah. As the, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, used to convey the message. Aisha, the, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, conveyed the message. How many of the followers of the companions learned the, learned the knowledge from Aisha? She used, she used to teach people the, the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She spent a significant amount of her life with the Prophet She listened to the Prophet Understood the Prophet And delivered the message of the Prophet To people who came after uh, the Prophet death. She taught many followers and scholars of Islam The religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So conveying the message of Allah Is an important obligation on every Muslim Male or female Male or female. And it's important to raise your children to make sure that they understand that it's very important to enjoy what's good and forbid what's haram. It's very important that we cultivate this in our children. So the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never change. If the Muslims, like the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and the followers, and, and as we're going to talk about many, many characters in these stories, they put Islam back in their life. They have the Islam as a have Islam as a priority in their life. Islam wins, and when Islam wins, then Subhanallah, this is a great victory for the whole Ummah. Now, the third point is Muslims spent a total of 805 years of Islamic civilization in Andalus. They conquered Al Andalus in the year 92 of Al Hijrah. 92 of, Hij of, uh, of Al Hijrah, and they went out of Al Andalus in the year 897 of Hijrah. 897 years of Hijrah. So, how many years did the Muslims spend in Andalus? Eight, more than 800 years. More than 800 years. It's close to 60% of the Islamic history. Two-thirds of the Islamic history, the Muslims spent in Andalus. So we need to learn about that history. We need to understand more about this history. And apply this in our lives. This is a significant amount of our history. We need to learn about it. Okay? So... SubhanAllah, more than 800 years Muslims spent in Andalus. Would you believe it? More than 800 years. SubhanAllah. Stories of great men, men and women. SubhanAllah. When you read the history of Al Andalus, you realize that there are many men and many women on their own. They completely changed the history of Islam, particularly in Andalus. You know, when you. Uh, see the story of someone like Abdul Rahman al dakhil We're going to talk about him, inshallah. He completely united Al Andalus under his leadership and transformed the Andalus completely. When you see someone by the name of Abdul Rahman al Nasr, he achieved complete unity and made victories that no one else dreamed about. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, he saved Al Andalus when he was 80 years of age. 80 years. When he was 80. He came all the way from Morocco to Al Andalus to save Al Andalus from falling into the hands of the Christians. Fatima al Fihriya, one of the greatest females of the Andalus history, she was a main factor in. in, in uh, in making sure that the universities of Al-Andalus teach the whole world the 
knowledge and the civilization that subhanAllah stemmed out of the Islamic universities in Al-Andalus. Because before Al-Andalus, Europe was in complete darkness. This is true. Europe was in complete and utter darkness. When you hear the story of Aisha al-Hurra, one of the latest queens of Al-Andalus, and what she's done to try, what she's done to try to save the, the kingdom of the Muslims in Grenada. SubhanAllah. Yani, stories that completely changed the history of Muslims. So this is very important to teach these stories to our children. So that they know, subhanAllah, that it's important to learn and look up to those figures. Those are the figures that the, our children should look up to. Not, you know, this famous actor, or this famous actress, or this singer, or this football player. They need to look up to the Muslim heroes. Not Superman, not Iron Man. They need to look up to the Muslim heroes. Okay? They need to look up to the Muslim heroes because these are the real heroes, not just on TV. These are the heroes who changed the story of the and the history of Muslims in our world. One man, one woman, one woman completely changed the, the history of uh, Islam in many parts during the Islamic civilization. And it's extremely important, as said this, to know how and why did the Muslim leave, leave, Muslims leave Al-Andalus. As painful as it is of a story, but it's very important for us to understand how and why did the Muslims, after more than 800 years spent in, in, in Al-Andalus, they left Al-Andalus. It is unprecedented in the history of the world that the Muslims entered a particular country or con conquered a particular country and then subhanAllah they lost and they totally moved away from the country and left this country. It is unprecedented before Al-Andalus. Always the Muslims would go in and subhanAllah teach people Islam they might lose the land for a while, but they regain it back. But subhanAllah, Al-Andalus is completely lost since the year of 897 year of Al-Hijrah. SubhanAllah. After 800 years. So it's very important for us to go through the reasons and the lessons. Why did the Muslims leave Al-Andalus? What happened? And why was the last king the last Amir of Al-Andalus, Abu Abdullah Muhammad, the last king, he was standing on the rock, the last, very last rock just south of Granada, and crying that he's lost the whole kingdom of Al-Andalus. And his mom, Aisha al-Hurra, said her famous word, cry like women, cry like women, on a kingdom that you couldn't preserve like real men. SubhanAllah. So we need to understand how this happened and why this happened. So inshallah, yani, through studying the story of Al-Andalus, inshallah, we'll go through these and answer those very important questions, inshallah. The road to Andalus, as we said, started probably more than 70 years before the Fath of Al-Andalus, before the conquest of Al-Andalus. The road starts with the conquest of Egypt and the whole of North Africa. This is the real start and this is the, way, the real road to Al-Andalus. And it started in the year of 21 of the Al-Hijrah, the year 21 of Al Hijrah. Now, going through the history of Al Andalus, there are some names that we really need to study and learn very yani, thoroughly and teach it to our children. And the very first name that comes is Uqba ibn Nafa. 
عقبة ابن نافع The great leader عقبة ابن نافع الفهري القرشي Now عقبة was born in مكة was born in مكة Some narrations say that he was born one year before Hijrah Other narrations say that he was born on the year of al Hijrah Okay? And Uqba ibn Nafa, by this, he is a companion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa entered Mecca when he was, when Uqba was about how many years? The conquest of Mecca. Just uh, approximate. Ten. Yeah, nine, ten. Exactly. So, this is was the, the, the age of Uqba ibn Nafa when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered Mecca. Okay? He, he, he was born one year before Hijrah and he died 60 years, uh, uh, 60 years of, after Hijrah. So some narrations say 62 and some narrations say 63. He was the cousin of Amr ibn al-As. He was the cousin of Amr ibn al-As. One of the greatest companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sorry, it's probably a bit difficult for you to see, but it's a bit hazy. But he is the cousin of Amr ibn al-As. Now, this is very important. This, the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, saw a vision during his sleep about Uqba ibn Nafa. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saw a vision. In his sleep about Uqba ibn Nafa, the small kid, yes, subhanAllah. And subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this, this hadith is uh, in Sahih al Imam Muslim. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that we are once sitting in the house, and then Uqba ibn Nafa, a child, came and gave us some dates. So the companions of the Prophet ﷺ asked, O oh, Prophet of Allah, how do you interpret this dream? The Prophet ﷺ said, I interpret this dream by Uqba ibn Nafa achieving a very high status in this dunya and in the hereafter. In this dunya and in the hereafter. And not look at the Prophet ﷺ. SubhanAllah. He tells Uqba. He doesn't just say to you know his family. He gets Uqba. He tells Uqba himself, the kid, that we saw, I saw you in a dream and that inshallah you will have a high status in this dunya and the hereafter. Now this is extremely important gesture from the Prophet and we have to stop it. The Prophet is saying this to Uqba so that he can encourage Uqba. To, to, to aspire to, to the Prophet وسلم, vision. And for Uqba ibn Nafa to grow up thinking the Prophet وسلم, saw this dream for me, and inshallah I'll do everything I can to achieve this inshallah. To achieve this inshallah. And this is what happened. And this is what we need to do with our children. We need to make sure we say to our children that and encourage them to look up to and to achieve high status in this dunya and hereafter by encouraging, encouraging them. And mashallah, there's always a very good thing that Sheikh Hassan says. That Sheikh Hassan says that when you're in a gathering of men, don't always leave your child to play with the kids. Make sure that your child also engage with the adults and sit with them so that your child is also, yani, is raised up with, mashallah, great confidence, with, mashallah, great uh, aspiration and looking up to those, mashallah, good, um, good people, inshallah. Not always when we sit together as adults, we always let the kids play. It's good for them to play, obviously. We don't say they, they, they won't play. I'm not saying you shouldn't play Omar. That's, it's very good to play. But what I'm saying is, it's extremely important also to make sure that your children aspire to and being an adult and growing up and encouraging their dreams 
say yes. SubhanAllah, the uh, Muhammad al-Fatih, the person who conquered Constantinia, and opened Turkey, his teacher would actually take him by hand when he was a little kid, and then he would, and SubhanAllah, they lived in a sort of a water distance, they could see the Turkey from the distance of the water. So, he said to him, you will be the person who conquers Constantinople. And as the Prophet وسلم, says about the person who opens the, 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 the city of Constantinople, that this is a city will be opened by the best army with the best leader. So see, he's encouraging, he's encouraging Muhammad al-Fatih from his, from the years of his youth to aspire to being something big. This is what we have to do with our children. Salah al-Din also, when he was young, he was brought up to the fact that he, inshallah, will liberate al-Quds. And he did it, subhanAllah. And then, subhanAllah, they would ask him, why don't you laugh a lot? Why don't you smile a lot? And he used to say, this is growing up, he used to say, how do I smile? And the Quds, Al-Aqsa, is in captivity. Now the Muslims smile, play, and they even forget about Al-Quds these days. They forget about Palestine. SubhanAllah. It's a big difference. So we need to make sure we raise our children to understand the Palestinian case. We shouldn't have our children say, well, you know, it's, it's fair enough, you know, the, 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 the Israels have a share of the land and the Palestinians have the share of the land and they need to have, you know, all this. This is a land that belongs to us. This is a land that belongs to the Palestinians. So it's very important that when the kids growing up that you teach them the important matters and the important cases of our Islam, of our religion. So they don't grow up thinking, you know, um, they don't have great aspirations in life. They need to have great aspirations and they need to be great leaders in life. So subhanAllah, Uqba ibn Nafa took that very seriously. He saw himself as the first conqueror of North Africa. And he went with the army that's going to liberate and going to conquer the Ashem, which is Lebanon and Syria and Palestine, when he was at the age of 15. So this is, as you can see, his CV and his achievements. At the age of 15, he went out with the Muslim army for the conquest of Al-Shem. And at the age of 18, he was with Amr ibn al-As, the army that liberated and, conquer and conquered Palestine. He was in that army. And he saw Umar ibn al-Khattab coming and the people of Palestine giving Umar ibn al-Khattab the keys to the Aqsa Mosque. At the age of 18, and subhanAllah, at the age of 21 years, he participated in the conquest of Egypt. 21, he was with the army of Amr ibn al-As, which conquered Egypt. And subhanAllah, Amr ibn al-As saw a real potential in Uqba ibn Nafa. And this is extremely important for us to learn that, inshallah, it's very important to invest in the youth and get them involved give him responsibilities and give him things to do. It's extremely important for our kids and our youth to participate. Yani, we would like that our kids and, uh, and our and the youth of the Hills District Muslim Society, inshallah, would, would have a very strong presence and do things, will do workshops, will we'll do all of these good things because they aspire to be the best, inshallah. So, and it's important for us to try to give them this opportunity. Don't say, sorry, you're too young. Let them try. Let them, let them, inshallah, give them the confidence, give them the advice, and let them try, inshallah. And this is what uh, Amr ibn al-Az did. He sent Uqba ibn Nafa 
on a very important mission. He sent him to, a, 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 to sort of an expedition and to get some very important information about Barqa. Barqa at that time is in, the, in Libya and was a major center for the, uh, the Libyan, uh, for Libya and for the Libyan trade and everything. It was such a, a great and important hub uh, in the, uh, for, the, for Libya at that time. So he sent Aqba ibn Nafa at the age of 22 to gather some very important information about the weaknesses and the strengths and how to um, achieve, you know, um, when they get, when they go into war with them, how, what's the weakest points that they can attack. And SubhanAllah, he gathered the information so well in a very systematic manner. SubhanAllah, even um, much more than Amr ibn As expected. And Amr ibn As, when, when Uqba uh, ibn Nafa got this information for him, he said, this boy is going to really have a great status in Islam. I need to give him more. He wasn't jealous of him. And this is extremely important. When we visit the Islamic history, subhanAllah, he found, he found that the companions and the great leaders for in Islam, they shared one very important quality, sincerity. Sincerity that they want to all only make, they only want to work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not want any material gains. All they wanted to achieve is the conveying the message of Islam to all the different parts of the world. And that's what they tried to achieve. So he sent Uqba ibn Nafa on a very important mission to guard and protect the borders, the southern and the western borders, borders of Egypt. And then after that, he sent him in a, on a mission to conquer the Nubia uh, territory, which is south of Egypt, which is uh, known as the south of Egypt now, and Sudan. And subhanAllah, every single mission that Amr ibn al-As has commissioned Aqba ibn Nafa to do, he executed it really well. And just remember that Aqba ibn Nafa is still in, ibn Nafa is still in, his, in his 20s. So, at the 27 years of age, at 27 years of age, Aqba ibn Nafa said, uh, Amr ibn As said that Aqba ibn Nafa has now to be the leader of the army. He has to be the leader of the army that enters Barqa and conquers Libya. And subhanAllah, he did it in such a beautiful manner and he was very strategic and tactic in his execution. So subhanAllah, Uqba ibn Nafa is one of the greatest leaders in our Muslim history. And all of our children need to know our, about Uqba ibn Nafa, the great leader of, our, of Islam. And subhanAllah, at the, at the age of 28, he conquest, he went on to conquest and conquer Tripoli, Tarabus in Libya, which is, was a very important city in Libya. And do you think that Uqba would stop at that? No, he wouldn't. He went to Tunisia, Tunis, and he conquered Tunisia. And he founded the city of al qayrawan which is a very important city till now in Tunis. And there is still a mosque in the, in the city of Qayrawan, a mosque known as Uqba ibn Nafi' Mosque. Then he went on and conquered the, the Algeria. And then he went on to get into Morocco and went all the way to Tanja or Tangier, which is right at the tip of Morocco, Morocco with the Atlantic Ocean. And subhanAllah, Ahmed ibn Nafi said something that's really amazing. And subhanAllah, it, it really says something about their ambition and enthusiasm to work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and convey the message of Islam. He said when he was at the city of Tanja, in Tangier, which is right at the tip of the, the Atlantic Ocean, and he looked at the Atlantic Ocean towards what is now the Americas. And he said, if, oh, oh you ocean, or oh, the sea, if I knew that behind you there is a land 
to conquer, I would go into you and conquer that land. Not knowing that behind this land is actually the Americans. But look at the ambition of the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the, 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 the realization of the vision of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the encouragement of Amr ibn al-As. And Amr ibn al-As fought Uqba ibn Nafa, all the military knowledge. He didn't say that I want to share this glory for myself. There's no glory. There's no personal glory. It's all about working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it doesn't matter if your name is not on the end product. As long as you work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. People don't need to know that you did this or did that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't have to inform people. You know the, the joke about you know the person who went inside the mosque and he was praying, and then he was praying very slowly, and people were saying about him, MashaAllah, look at him, he prays really well, he, he spends a long time in the, in saying the Fatiha, he spends a long time prostrating. So he heard those people saying that, and then he interrupted his prayer, and he said to them, I, I'm fasting too. <laughs> so the sincerity towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extremely important. People don't know, need to know that you work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Sahaba and the great leaders of Islam, they didn't work for, for anything. They didn't want to achieve any personal glories. And subhanAllah, in the history, visiting the history, some of the, uh, the history of Islam was unfortunately uh, changed. And bad things are said about the leaders of Islam. In, in order to try to, you know, um, prove to the, to the world that the Muslims are, you know, barbaric and, and these things. But subhanAllah, wallah, if you visit the history, revisit the history of the Muslims compared to the, the history of other nations, subhanAllah, the Muslims have got the greatest share of mercy, compassion, kindness, tolerance, to all the people and all the countries that they went to. Take for example Egypt. My original family, from the, my great great grandfathers, they are Christians. They come from mother, my mother's side. They come from uh, Greece and from my mother's side towards her father. They come from Syria, and they are Christians. But Subhanallah. They accepted Islam. Because, subhanAllah, when Amr ibn As went inside Egypt, the Romans were persecuting the Christians. This is all known. But subhanAllah, when Muslims came, they realized that Islam is full of mercy, tolerance, kindness. It's the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? Why wouldn't it be? And then people from everywhere in Egypt started to embrace Islam. And Alhamdulillah, I am a Muslim because of the conquest of Amr ibn As. Obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that. But Amr ibn As was one of the reasons that this whole North Africa was, was conquered. A man that he, inshallah, will take the hasanat and rewards from all this. And Uqba ibn Nafa, who conquered North Africa. And inshallah, we will talk about Musa ibn Musayr too. He is the planner for the conquest of Al-Andalus. People think that Tariq ibn Ziyad, he's the only person who, who got into the Andalus. Well, he is the leader of the conquest. But subhanAllah, all of these men, Amr ibn As, Uqba ibn Nafa, Musa ibn Musayr, in fact, Musa ibn is, is a co-conqueror uh, 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 of the Al-Andalus. What is the name of the, the mountain in the, the area where uh, Tariq ibn Ziyad landed? It's called Tariq ibn Ziyad. Is, is the mountain called uh, 
Musa, the mountain of Musa, Ibn Musayyib? No. Why? Sincerity. Even though that he's planned the whole thing. At the end of the day, this is very important. When you read the Islamic history, especially the history of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and the Sunnah, so many bad stories about the companions fighting among each other. There was a fitna happened. But when you're reading these stories, you have to understand the first thing, that these are men who were brought up by the Prophet They are men, they make mistakes, but at the end of the day, they have sincerity in their hearts. So this is the eye, and this is your heart when you read the Islamic history. Okay? You think good of your brothers, the companions of the Prophet So, so as you see here, this is about, sorry, not sure if I can, uh, sorry, oh. as you can see here, this is the whole area that Awf ibn Nafa conquered, starting from Tunisia, here is Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, all the way, all the way to Tanja, where here is the Atlantic Ocean. About 2,000 kilometers, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Raqba ibn Nafa did a mistake. That mistake is that he never really engaged with the people and the tribes of Northern Africa, known as the Barbar or the Amazigh. He never really engaged with them. And that's why every time he would open a city, the, the Barbar uh, or the Amazigh, together with the Romans, they would come back behind his back and regain this country or this area from him again. Every time he would go into a country, he would win it, and then unfortunately it would be taken away from him again. He actually conquered North Africa twice, eight years between them. But he never really engaged the, the people of the Barba. He didn't really stop and teach those people the real Islam. So not a lot of people engaged and embraced Islam. And that's why every time that he would get into a particular country and then move on to another country and come back, he would find that this country is already taken back by the Barbar and the Roman and the Byzantine Empire. And this is a, an extremely important lesson that the next leader, Musa ibn Nusayr, will learn. Very important lesson to learn. But we cannot really blame Aqba ibn Nafa. He is the first person to conquer North Africa. And as it's important for us to know that when Edison invented the electric lamp, he went through thousands of experiments to get to the end result. Mistake after mistake, error and trial, error and trial. And this is what happened with Aqba ibn Nafa. This is a, as an error that he did not tackle and a mistake that he did, but subhanAllah, He's a great leader of our ummah. And he's the first one to do it. So the first one who does something, usually there are gaps or holes, then the next person comes and picks up that process and improves it, as in any industry process, as in any company corporate process. There's always improvement. So this is what, this big mistake, subhanAllah, this, this mistake even caused Aqba ibn Nafa in his life. Because the, the Barbar and the Romans realized that Rahba ibn Nafa is so strong that they cannot beat him. And every time he comes back and invade uh, and they conquer the, the country back uh, another time, and then they have to sort of go behind his back when he moves on. So they decided to kill him. And subhanAllah, Rahba ibn Nafa was on his way back from a battle from Morocco, and they killed him on his way between Morocco and Julia, um, some narration says that he, he is buried in somewhere in Algeria. SubhanAllah. So the Romans and the Barbar killed Aqba ibn Nafa, and what was his age when he died? Uh, a 
about 62 or 63 years in some relations. So this is Rahma the Nafa, the great leader of Islam. So he, subhanAllah, he, what he did it was not wasted. But subhanAllah, is a big a, a, a mistake that he did that he did not engage the people of al Amazigh. So we move on to the next hero. His name is Musa ibn Musayr. Musa ibn Musayr. He is with together with Talq ibn Ziyad, the conqueror of Al Andalus. And yet, when it comes to Andalus, people only remember Talq ibn Ziyad. This is what I'm saying sincerity. Sincerity. He, he doesn't mind that Talq ibn Ziyad will get the credit. Because he knows that he works for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa ibn Nusayr was born in, on the 19 years of Hijrah in Palestine. He was born in Palestine. He was the son of Nusayr. Nusayr was one of the greatest scholars of Persia. When Khalid ibn Walid, one of the greatest companions of the Prophet وسلم, conquered Persia, he found these bright scholars in a particular uh, uh, castle. And he took them all the way from Persia back to Medina at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So Nusayr was also with other scholars of Persia and one of them is very famous, his name is Sirin. He's the father of Muhammad ibn Sirin, one of the greatest scholars of Islam. He's very famous for his book of the interpretation of dreams. One of the best scholars of Islam, too, about the interpretation of dreams according to the prophetic way. So Nusayr, when he came back and saw the treatment of Abu Bakr, anhu, the da'wah of Abu Bakr, the kindness, the tolerance, he accepted and embraced Islam. And not only that, he loved Islam so much. And subhanAllah, he made his son Musa Memorized the Quran at the age of seven years. Memorized the whole Quran. Not just just a few surahs. By the age of seven, some narrations say by the age of seven, he memorized the whole Quran. SubhanAllah. And Musa ibn Nusayr. Um, he, he learned from his father a very important message. Is that you have to make sure, teach the people the real Islam. This is how we love Islam. And he, his father, showed him the difference between Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and other people. Abu Bakr was so keen when these prisoners came from, from Persia. He didn't just treat them the treatment of prisoners. SubhanAllah. He knew how to capture the hearts of people, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And he taught them Islam. And subhanAllah, they embraced Islam and they loved Islam so much. He looked up, as grow, growing up, Musa ibn Nusayr looked up to Khalid ibn Walid as a great leader. And this is extremely important for the fathers to make sure that your children look up to a very important Islamic figure, as we said before. And subhanAllah, they, his father, Musayr, with, with his son, moved to Palestine. And in fact, his father, Musayr, was um, commissioned to be the head of the police at the time of the, the governor of uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, when he was the governor of Ashim. And subhanAllah, Musa ibn Musayr chose, chose his way. He chose, he looked at Muawiyah and looked at Khalid ibn Walid. He looked at the politician and the conqueror, Khalid ibn Walid. And he chose his way. He wanted to be like Khalid ibn Walid. So when the Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan was building an Islamic navy, he signed up for the first class. And he showed extreme. Um, uh, keenness and he was extremely clever and he came top of his class when it came to 
graduating from the very first class that was um, in charge of the Islamic Navy. He was only 28 years of age when Muawiyah ibn Sufyan commissioned him to be the commander-in-chief for the whole Islamic Navy. This is a story that's repeating itself again with Uqba ibn Nafa. We saw that Uqba ibn Nafa in his 20s, he was also a great leader. And this is extremely important. So Musa ibn Nusayr, his father was not originally a Muslim, but he embraced Islam because he loved Islam. And this is very important for us. How can Islam change the lives of those people? And how can Islam make those people love Islam so much that they want to give so much for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Musa ibn Nusayr, with all this love that his father taught him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the sake of this religion, he became the first commander-in-chief of the Islamic Navy. And in fact, he conquered Cyprus with the first Islamic Navy. He was only 28, 29 years of age, Musa ibn Musayr. But Musa ibn Musayr had a dream. His dream did not stop at Cyprus. He had a dream to reconquer the whole of Northern Africa, which is unfortunately now, except Egypt and Barqa, has fallen again after the death of Uqba ibn Nafa in the hands of the Romans and in the hands of the Barbary. He had a dream. But a dream that he's not just dreaming when he's sleeping. The real dreams, brothers and sisters, are the dreams that you achieve when you are awake. He had a dream. And his dream was to conquer the whole of North Africa again and conquer Andalus and spread the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was his dream. You know Martin Luther King when he says, I have a dream, with obviously a big difference between the two characters. But great leaders, they have a dream, they have a vision, and they plan and they work hard. Like Alhamdulillah, we now have a vision, inshallah, to build our mosque and work for it, inshallah. I have a dream that my kids, inshallah, would go to the best and the, inshallah one of the greatest mosques in Sydney. We have a dream. We work for it. And it's not a dream that we just dream about when we are sleeping. It's a dream that we work towards when we are awake. This is the real dream. And this is how you should set your goals. You have a dream to be successful in life. Good. Work for it. Plan for it. You have a dream to enter Jannah. Work hard for it. Plan for it. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help. You have a dream to participate in the da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you achieve it. You work hard. There are going to be difficulties sometimes. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did that. All the companions did that. All the greatest men in history, Muslims or non-Muslims, they had dreams. And they planned and worked hard to achieve those dreams. And this is what Musa ibn Nusayr did. In fact, Musa ibn Nusayr was taken away because of a political problem, was taken away from the commander-in-chief position. But yet, he studied the maps of North Africa. He studied the people of North Africa. He studied the, he studied the nature of the, the Barber, the Amazigh. He studied them really well. He studied the maps. He planned and planned and planned for years and years. And not until he was in his 40s or 50s that he had the first grasps of achieving his dream. When the, the governor of Egypt at the time, his name is Abd al-Aziz, Ibn Abd al-Malik, he is the father of Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz, the greatest uh, Amir of the Mu'mineen. He, at the time, he, Abd al-Aziz went to uh, one of the Khalifa of the Muslimin at that time, uh, Abd al-Malik, and he asked him for a man to conquer the northern of Africa. And he said, I want Musa ibn Nusayr. 
because he heard about him. He heard about his hard work. He heard about that this guy has got a plan, that this guy has got a dream and a vision and a plan in order to achieve his dream. And he said to him, I want Musa ibn Rasayr to be in charge of the liberation of the whole of Northern Africa. And subhanAllah, Musa ibn Rasayr was back on the map. But the first thing he did to learn from the mistakes of Aqba ibn Nafa. And he then approached the people of Barbar. He taught them Islam. And every single time he would liberate a country, a conquer a country, he would not do it quickly. He would stay in that country. Get the people of the Barbar. Teach, the, teach them Islam. Teach them the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love of jihad. Invest in people. And this is extremely important. Now, the most successful companies in the world are successful because their employees have very high level of satisfaction. Because their companies invest in them through professional development, through seminars, through bonuses, awards. And this is what Musa ibn Sayyid did strategically. He invested in the people of the Barbar. He invested time. He invested... Um, his time with them so that they can learn Islam. And subhanAllah, the results were nothing short of spectacular. The Barber started to embrace Islam in large numbers. And whenever country he conquered again, it stayed with the Muslims. In fact, all the countries that he conquered is with the Muslims until today. Egypt, Libya, Tunis, Morocco, So subhanAllah, he engaged the people of Barbar. And the, the Barbar were people of the indigenous northern Africa. And they were pretty much habitants of the, uh, uh, from the west, from Morocco, up until Libya. And from the Mediterranean Sea, up until the river of Niger. So a big, large population. They're called Barbar or Al-Amazir. And not only this, Musa ibn Rasul did something extremely important. He approached one of the most brightest people of the Barbar. His name is Tarak ibn Ziyad. He approached him. And he saw that, mashallah, this person has got the, the qualities of a fighter, of a warrior, but also he has got taqwa, is pious. And when we say barber, something that comes to mind that the barber people are black and very dark skinned. In fact, a great um, percentage of the people of barber, they actually have blonde hair and uh, you know, blue eyes and they look like Europeans. And Tariq ibn Ziyad was like this. He wasn't dark, subhanAllah, he was blonde, had blue eyes and he was subhanAllah very well built and very good looking, mashallah, very handsome. But he did not just go for the, the, the material gains of this life. He wanted to be working for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And his position was to be the leader of the army of Musa ibn Usayr. And to, inshallah, help Musa ibn Usayr with the conquest of Al Andalus. And inshallah, in the next lecture in two weeks' time, because inshallah, this lecture will be offered every second Friday, alternating with the, the, the latest halakas in um, Kellyville. Inshallah, so we avoid clashing and allow inshallah the men and women to participate in this halaqa. Inshallah, in two weeks' time, inshallah, we'll have, um, uh, so two weeks' time will be the 11th of April, inshallah, we will have, inshallah, the next lecture. The next lecture, inshallah, will be an absolute thriller. It will be, inshallah, the conquest of Al-Andalus and the introduction to the conquest of Al-Andalus. And how Musa ibn Rusayr um, overcame the obstacles and the barriers to get to Andalus. And what did Tariq ibn Ziyad do to get into the Andalus is nothing short of brilliant. SubhanAllah, something that it's just amazing. It's like 
Yeah, I mean, as I said, it's like that you're opening a treasury. You're opening a treasure, subhanAllah, it's even better than the treasures of this whole world, the history of the Islamic civilization in Andalus. Inshallah, we'll stop here and uh, we'll take any questions if there are any questions or comments or feedback. Uh, Jazakallah. Mm.